Sky just uploaded this fantastic roundtable discussion about Anthony Joshua and Andy Ruiz to their YouTube channel Sky Sports Boxing. On the panel, you've got Paulie Malinaji, Carl Froch, Johnny Nelson, Tony Bellew, and David Hay. And among them, they've all fought at the top level as professionals, all had extensive amateur backgrounds, all but one of them, which is Carl Froch, has been stopped before in a professional fight. So they bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to this discussion and all make some very good points. They don't all agree on everything, as you would expect, because you've got different personalities, you've got different styles that they all had as professionals. But that's why it's so great to have all of these guys with their wealth of experience coming together and having this uh, discussion slash debate. So fantastic, can't recommend it highly enough. And what I'm gonna do in this video is pick out some of the best bits as topics for discussion. So first of all, they talk about the fact that Andy Ruiz came in as a relatively late replacement for Jarrell Miller. And Paulie Malinaji and one or two of the others say that perhaps AJ was psychologically geared up to face Jarrell Miller because of the fact that Miller was very hostile. He was talking a lot of smack. He kind of got under AJ's skin and made AJ angry. And so when Miller tested positive and was removed from the fight, it was maybe a bit of a psychological and emotional come down for AJ because not only had he been training and preparing himself to fight and try and defeat Miller, but he really wanted to hurt him. And so in comes Andy Ruiz, who's this unassuming guy, smaller than Jarrell Miller in, well, in height and weight, a very unassuming kind of character. He was perhaps going out of his way to be humble, to try and rock Anthony Joshua to sleep and lull him into a full sense of security. And in the opinion of a couple of them, they think that might have had an effect on Anthony, Anthony Joshua and he wasn't as keyed up as he should have been or perhaps would have been if he'd fought Jarrell Miller. Okay, he was gearing himself up for that guy who he really didn't like and he really wanted to hurt. In comes Ruiz and Ruiz is like, uh, he's some little nice guy. And Paulie Mal Malinaji relays an interesting story from his career where he went through something similar. And it was also with a Mexican fighter. He said this Mexican guy that he was about to fight, I think it was on uh, Malinaji's rise to world level. This guy was bowing to Paulie Malinaji before the fight, playing Mr. Nice Guy, uh, giving him a ridiculous amount of respect to the point where Malinaji says he always looks in his opponent's eye before the opening bell when the referee's reading the instructions. And he will barely touch gloves. He basically wants to let the opponent know from then that I'm not your friend. But in this particular instance, when he fought this Mexican guy who was being super nice to him before the fight, Malinaji said he couldn't even look in the guy's eye. And not because he was scared of the guy, he couldn't look him in the eye because he almost felt sorry for what was about to happen to the guy, you know? <laughs> he thought it was going to be an easy fight. But the way it turned out, it was a really rough fight for Paulie Malinaji, which he did win, but it was rough. So that was an interesting story by Malinaji because it is a thing in boxing, a psychological tactic that some fighters use where I keep on you know, using the same term, they rock you to sleep. They, they draw you into a full sense of security by playing Mr. Nice Guy. Uh, Johnny Nelson had, uh, did he say, what, what's the term that Johnny Nelson came out with, the phrase? Play the fool to catch the wise man or something? Play the fool to trick the wise man? I don't know what it was, but words to that effect. So yeah, good point by Paulie Malinaji and others. That could have had a psychological effect on AJ. Who knows? Another point which is raised in this discussion, which David Hay brings up and pretty much all of the panel agree with, is the fact that Anthony Joshua is learning on the job. He didn't have an extensive amateur background like the guys on the panel did. Anthony Joshua started boxing as an amateur in his very late teens or early 20s. So that was pretty late for him to start. 
And as an amateur, I think he only had about 40 fights. And as a pro, he's had 23 fights. So Anthony Joshua, among the fighters who have competed at world championship level in the heavyweight division over the past four or five years, he's probably the least experienced of you know the guys who are still relevant at the top level. Andy Ruiz, more experienced than Anthony Joshua. Andy Ruiz has been boxing since he was like five years old. Had more amateur fights than AJ, more professional fights than AJ. Deontay Wilder also started late like AJ and had, you know, I think a similar number of amateur fights. But as a professional, of course, Deontay Wilder's had way more amateur, uh, way more professional fights than Anthony Joshua. So you got Ruiz with more experience than AJ, Wilder with more experience than AJ, Tyson Fury with more experience than AJ, Povetkin with more experience than AJ, uh, Michael Hunter with more. Literally, AJ is one of the least experienced people when it comes to overall boxing, amateur and pro out of all the top guys out there. And so the guys on the panel say that this is potentially a factor which may determine whether AJ can come through the rematch. Because when you've been through, as David Hay says, the formative years coming up in boxing as an amateur, where you've taken all the beatings in the gym, you've taken the beatings in sparring, you've been through different experiences, traveling all all over the world as an international amateur, When you go through adversity as a pro, you can draw on that experience. You know, Anthony Joshua had a whirlwind amateur career and a whirlwind pro career so far. He hasn't really had much time to relax, take stock and learn and grow at the normal pace. He's been fast tracked, amateur and pro. And perhaps now, see, this is why I wasn't too keen on Anthony Joshua taking the immediate rematch, because now would be an opportunity for him to actually take a step back, pump the brakes a little bit, and do do some learning, which he hasn't really been allowed to do prior to now because of the fact that he's agreed to be fast-tracked like this. So, yeah, that was another good point that was made. Tony Bellew keeps coming back to the same point. He believes that the panel are overcomplicating the Anthony Joshua, Andy Ruiz first fight and what AJ must do in the rematch. I mean, he clearly feels that the rematch is a more complicated fight than the first fight. But ultimately, in terms of what went wrong first time around, he doesn't buy into all the theories that AJ was concussed or even if those things did happen, Bellew doesn't think it had much bearing on the way the fight turned out. As far as he's concerned, AJ was winning the first couple rounds. He was on his way to winning the third round. He landed a big left hook, dropped Andy Ruiz. When Ruiz got up, AJ rushed in prematurely, got caught on a temple with a left hook, which he never recovered from for the rest of the fight. Very simple. So Bellew believes that people are overcomplicating what happened with all these theories about sparring and panic attacks and all this kind of stuff. He just thinks it's straightforward, man. Rushed in when he'd knocked a guy down, got caught with a shot and just couldn't recover from it. And the rest of the panel do, I think it's a a question put up by Johnny Nelson. They do talk about whether this is a weakness of AJ's. The fact that he seems unable to recover from being hurt, at least unable to recover very quickly because he did recover, of course, against Dylan White and he did recover against uh, Vladimir Klitschko came back to win those fights. But it took him a while. It took him several rounds, particularly in the Klitschko fight, to recover from being hurt those times. So in one part of the discussion, Carl Frutch is talking about the fights he had with George Groves. And humorously, he jokes about you know being beat up in the first Groves fight and his man, as he describes him, Howard Foster, uh, coming in and doing his job because he knew the script, quote unquote, which is, you know, Carl Frotch obviously being facetious, but yeah, that was funny. But what Carl Frotch was saying in the rematch is that he made a tactical decision not to concede the center of the ring to George Groves in the rematch. Because in the first fight, he had to back up a lot, right? In the rematch, he said, I'm not going to back up. I'm going to keep this fight in the center of the ring. Anytime he comes forward at me, I'm going to match him. You know, I'm going to hit him with something to keep him off. And it worked. But 
Andy Ruiz is not George Groves. I don't think that's the way for Anthony Joshua to approach this rematch, personally. Uh, Carl Froch might and some of the panelists might. I don't think it is. Because George Groves is not a front foot counterpuncher. George Groves is not a pressure fighter. Andy Ruiz is both those things. You know, if you stand in the center of the ring against George Groves, he doesn't want to get close to you. He wants to maintain distance. So you can stand in the center of the ring and say, okay, I'm not going to back off. As long as you've got his long range shots, his, his pot shots and jabs covered, you can block, you can take a little step back. Then you're good against George Groves in the center of the ring. Yeah, as long as, if you're Carl Froch anyway, because he's got long arms, longer arms than Groves actually. But with Anthony Joshua, he's fighting an Andy Ruiz who wants him to stay still. If you're in the center of the ring, and you've made your mind up, you're not going to move from the center ring, you're going to keep that center ring position, well then, you're going to end up in a shootout with Andy Ruiz, and you don't want that, that's how you lost the first fight, so I completely disagree that AJ needs to keep center ring, not at all, you see, Andy Ruiz is not so f fast footed, that he's going to have you running around the ring 100 miles an hour, and gassing out because you're moving so much, Ruiz doesn't have foot speed like that, He's a plodder. He's got very fast hands, but his foot speed is not that quick. Yeah, he was distressing Anthony Joshua after the third round knockdown with his pressure, but that's because AJ couldn't recover. Prior to that, AJ wasn't getting hit with all them shots he got hit with after the third round. His legs never really came back. His head was still in a daze several rounds after he got hit with that left hook. You see, so, yeah, I don't think Anthony Joshua should stamp his authority, you know, put his flag in the ground and say, I'm not moving from the center of the ring. I think that's a big mistake. If you look at the first fight with AJ and Ruiz, anytime, Ruiz, anytime AJ actually tried to hold center ring, Ruiz was able to get punches off, combinations against AJ, hit him in the body, you know, combinate, which often were blocked by AJ on his gloves. And this was even before the knockdown. I think it was at the start of round three. Might be a start around two or start around three. AJ takes center ring and he doesn't move when Ruiz is coming towards him. Ruiz gets combinations off. A guy who has such fast hands as Ruiz, who's shorter than you, who's, who's good at going to the body, you don't want to let him get that close. You want to maintain distance. And therefore, maintaining, di particularly against the guy who's going to punch with you. Yeah? The trigger for Ruiz is when you start punching, then he, st he immediately starts punching. He's got quick reflexes with that front foot counter punching, yeah? You want to keep him off balance. You want to keep his feet constantly moving so that it's going to take him a split second extra to get power into his punches and react to what you're doing. If you stand still, you're playing into Andy Ruiz's hands. Trying to hold center ring, be this macho guy. Well, I'm going to hurt. No, 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 no. AJ needs to move around, just like Joseph Parker did. Joseph Parker didn't try to take the center of the ring and do the... No, he moved around. Now, some people say Ruiz won the Parker fight. Well, whether you think Ruiz won it or not, what we can all agree on is Joseph Parker did a hell of a lot better than Anthony Joshua. He didn't get bounced up, up, up and down off the canvas four times. He stayed on his feet and he made it close enough to whereby some people feel like Parker won and some people feel like Ruiz won. Obviously, Anthony Joshua is much bigger, hits harder, longer arms than Joseph Parker. So if he employs those same tactics where he concedes, concede the center of the ring to, to Ruiz, it's okay. He's not so fast that he's going to have you running around all over the place, desperately trying to get away. He, he's not that quick on his feet. Yeah. So that's a point that Carl Froch makes, but I, I disagree with that. I don't think he needs to box the way Froch did against Groves. I think that would be a mistake. Another very interesting part of the discussion was when... Johnny Nelson said that Anthony Joshua was dropping down to Andy Ruiz's height. I mean, he wasn't dropping down quite that low, but I understand what Johnny Nelson was saying. He, uh, AJ was having his left hand down at certain points. He did it also against Povetkin. At certain points, he'd have his left hand down and he'd adopt a wider stance to bring his height down to the similar kind of level as Povetkin. Now, the panel discuss whether or not this is a good idea. And Malinaji, a very, very good analyst, says it depends on the situation. Because I often get this question from people. Why does this fighter have a wide stance? Why does that fighter have a wide? Oh my God, your stance is too wide. Look, 
you use different techniques against different opponents in different situations. Against certain opponents, you're going to be better off, off having a wide stance. Again, it also depends on your own attributes. All right? Somebody like Andy Ruiz, I mean, they're not really going to benefit from a wide stance, particularly not at his weight. Okay? But if you're an AJ, if you're a more versatile boxer, there are times when you're going to want to adopt a more wide stance. There are times when you're going to want to be more straight up. It just depends on the situation and it depends on the opponent. And that is what Paulie Malignaggi explains very, very well. I mean, he says that when you drop down to the level of your opponent, when you've got a more wide stance, and David Hay also talks about this because he would box with a wide stance. When you drop down to the level of your opponent, but you've still got longer arms than him, it's easier to see the gaps within which you can hit him. If you stand up tall and your opponent's shorter and he's down there and he's got his hands up and he's coming in bobbing and weaving, it's harder to see the gaps where you can hit him. So sometimes you want to drop down, especially if you've got the longer arms, so you can see the gaps of your shorter opponent. Yeah? So again, that's something which was very, very well explained by Paulie Malinaji and by David Hay. Now, as far as whether AJ wants to drop down to Andy Ruiz's level, I would say no, don't drop down to Ruiz's level. Um, I've long said that AJ keeping his left hand down and boxing in kind of a relaxed style at long range is not a bad idea because that's not what was getting him caught in the first fight. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't look at the first fight and say, okay, I've got to do everything different. No, because there were certain things in the first fight that were working. So don't throw them out just because other things didn't work. And for me, holding center ring didn't work for AJ in the first fight. Keeping his hands up didn't work for AJ in the first fight at long range. Up close, you want to keep your hands very, very tight, you know, and guard yourself against Andy Ruiz and of course, tie him up up close. Yeah. So anytime Ruiz gets into mid range or close range, of course you want to guard yourself and keep your hands up. But at long range, when you're moving around, when you know he doesn't have the foot speed to cover the distance when you're at a certain range, get that left hand down. Because not only does it split Ruiz's attention from watching your left hand, because you could walk him onto a hard jab, which AJ did several times in the first couple of rounds. Not only does it split his attention between that hard jab, which he's trying to watch for, which is coming up from somewhere around your knee, out of his peripheral vision, he's not only watching for that, but his attention is also split with the right hand, which is up by your chin. He's not sure which one to watch for. It makes him more cautious, okay? Not only does it do that, but also it stops you getting so tired. For a big guy like Anthony Joshua, trust me, keeping your arms up for 12 rounds is tiring. This is why a lot of guys, even somebody like Lennox Lewis, perhaps even Tyson Fury, they box a lot of the fight with their left hand down, sometimes with both hands down, because it's less tiring. It allows them to stay more loose and relaxed and burn less energy. So, you know, that's one point I would definitely make about that. Another thing that David Hay mentioned is that he relied on power in order to shut down an opponent's offense. And, well, power and counter-punching. Because when an opponent would throw a jab, for example, he would counter with a big right hand and the opponent would think, okay, I don't want to get hit with that shot again. Let me not throw the jab. So when the opponent goes back to the corner and his trainer is telling him, throw the jab, hit him with a jab. What the trainer may not understand is that the guy's being countered when he throws the jab with hard shots that he doesn't want to take too many of. You see, so there are certain things that trainers can see from the corner, but sometimes trainers miss certain things. Which is why I always feel like, look, you, you can get trainers who have never boxed that turn out to be very good trainers, but for the most part, you want a trainer who's boxed, preferably somebody who's got an extensive boxing career, be it an extensive amateur career or extensive pro career, because they understand the things that you're feeling. You know, they understand that if you're in there with a guy who's really good on the counter and he's a hard puncher, he might take certain punches away from you, you know? So anyway, David Hay explained that, that in order to establish respect, you have to hit a guy hard and fast early. Well, again, with Andy Ruiz, 
I don't necessarily think, you know, I don't think that's really necessary for Anthony Joshua. Ruiz doesn't have these amazing quick feet where he's going to dart in like Mike Tyson. That, that's not Ruiz. He's a plodder. If you stay away from him and you actually f frustrate him and make him start charging at you, he's going to fall off balance. He's going to leave gaps in his uh, defense and you're going to be able to hit him with clean shots. You don't need to go out there looking for a big shot against Andy Ruiz. I think if you do, that's when you're going to get yourself in trouble. You just want to frustrate him, keep him at long range, you know, tie him up up close and be very careful when you tie him up. I mentioned this before the first fight. Be very careful when you tie Andy Ruiz up because he's very good at exploding out of a clinch and landing hard, fast combinations at very close range. I've seen him do that in many fights over the years. Yeah, sometimes two guys will come together in a clinch and one of them will think, okay, I'm safe now, we're in a clinch. And it, but with Andy Ruiz, no, he'll explode out of the clinch suddenly with these fast hooks. Be very, very careful of that. Whenever you clinch the guy, make sure you got him tight. AJ did it well prior to the third round, prior to getting caught, okay? But like I say, um, I don't think you need to go out there with the intention of hitting Andy Ruiz hard and faster. No, 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 no. He's not that kind of fighter who's going to keep you under insurmountable, you know, relentless pressure to whereby you need to do that. Joseph Parker didn't take center, hit Ruiz or something hard to this guy. No, he really didn't do that. And he, he didn't have to. Yeah, again, whether or not you think Ruiz should have got the nod in that fight or whether Parker did enough, Parker wasn't getting hit with loads of clean punches against Andy Ruiz. He was able to go the distance fairly comfortably. And many other fighters have gone the distance against Andy Ruiz, by the way. Yeah? So, again, it's, it's, for me, it's not about this macho thing of you need to hurt Ruiz. That's, a, that's a David Hayes' mindset. And perhaps that's how David Hay would have to fight Ruiz because he doesn't have the height and reach advantages of somebody like AJ. But as far as I'm concerned, AJ don't need to do that. Just frustrate Ruiz, fiddle him, you know, mess him around, fight a fiddly fight, get him frustrated. Once he gets frustrated, he will start to make mistakes and then you're going to catch him. The, the opportunities will present themselves as he tries to rush in because he's not, you know, because he's so heavy, he can't move his feet quickly into range and stay on balance at the same time like a Mike Tyson could. He can't do that. Tyson was only, you know, in his prime, 215 to 221. So he could move into range real quick and he was athletic. He moved into range real quick and get shots off real quick. Ruiz can't do that. Yeah, he's going to rely on you to, he's relying on you to stay in one place for too long. That's what he's relying on. They also talk about the question over whether AJ quit. Now, none of us are in Anthony Joshua's head. Anthony Joshua certainly didn't say, I don't want to continue. When the referee asked AJ to want to continue, AJ said yes. So nobody can come out and claim that AJ said, oh, I've had enough. You know, like Chad Dawson did when he fought Andre Ward, when he said, I've had enough. When Roberto Duran said, no mas against Ray Leonard in a rematch. Yeah, AJ never did that. But people are trying to argue that AJ deliberately gave off certain negative signals to the referee to try and prompt the ref to stop it. Rather than actually coming out of his mouth and saying, I've had enough, he was trying to prompt the ref by giving certain signals. Okay, now the first thing, which Paulie Malignaggi shuts down is the whole thing about Anthony Joshua spitting out his gum shield. Spitting out your gum shield is a veteran move. I mean, if you don't realize that fighters spit their gum shield out when they still want to win a fight very often, then you're a damn fool. I mean, when did you start watching boxing? Last week? Fighters spit their gum shield out to get extra time to recover. That's why they do it. Sometimes fighters actually spit their gum shield out during the action, not even when they get knocked down, sometimes during the action. I've seen fights where a fighter will get knocked down and he'll spit his gum shield out and the referee will actually admonish him, say, don't spit your gum shield out or even take a point for him spitting his gum shield out because the ref understands what he's trying to do. He's trying to buy extra time. So that right there was not a sign as far as I'm concerned, a smoking gun sign that AJ was quitting because he spit his gum shield out. He's trying to get extra time to recover, which is a smart move. Malinaji says it's a smart move and most of the others on the panel say it was a smart move. Now, when AJ gets up, 
and he goes to the corner. The way I see it, AJ was trying to stay relaxed in the moment. He was trying not to panic. He and and that's why he even he tried to walk forward. The referee pushed him back. He put his arms on the ropes. Right? He was trying to stay relaxed. Okay, let me just calm my head my, my head down, try and stay relaxed in the moment. Yeah. There was a miscommunication between him and the ref. The ref stopped the fight. That's what I saw. And AJ actually did a video where he explained what was going through his head in that moment. And it made perfect sense because prior to watching that video, I wasn't sure whether AJ quit or not. I can't be 100% now, but I'm pretty much 95% sure AJ didn't quit or you know, wasn't deliberately trying to give off signals that would prompt the refs to, ref to stop it. Paul Malinaji is on the same page. He feels as though AJ didn't quit. That's what he says in this roundtable discussion. He's more, or at least he says he's leaning more towards the side that AJ didn't quit. David Hay, on the other hand, seems to be leaning more towards the side that AJ did quit. That AJ did give off certain signals to try and prompt the ref to stop it. Tony Bellew, he feels AJ didn't. He's adamant that AJ did not quit. So they're all, you know, a few of them are kind of split on whether they think he quit or not. But Again, one thing we know for certain is he, he definitely never uttered the word I quit, uh, the words I quit. He, he definitely, when the referee asked him, do you want to continue, said yes. He never said no. <laughs> so anyway, Malinaji also talks about the kind of tactics he's used because he's been knocked down a number of times in his career. And he talks about the tactics he's used in the past to get extra time to recover. So sometimes he'll walk around the ring you know, but he says he's cognizant enough to know that he has to stay in contact with the referee when he's taking a walk around the ring. What, what One of the things he'd try and do is walk to the corner or walk to the part of the ring which is furthest away from his opponent <laughs> so that his opponent has to come all the way over to the other side of the ring to get to him uh, once the fight resumes. So Paul Lindemann and Argy being a veteran, you know, being knocked down multiple times in his career, he has picked up these tricks and tactics over the years in terms of how to buy extra time uh, when you've been hurt. Again, this is a guy who's far more experienced than Anthony Joshua. Anthony Joshua, what, 40 amateur fights? There are thereabouts as a pro 20, 22 fights going into the Ruiz fight. He doesn't have all that experience to know. And he certainly doesn't have all, all that experience of getting knocked down as a pro as Paul Emanenaji has. Prior to the Andy Ruiz fight, he'd only been down once as a pro against Klitschko. So again, lack of experience there. They talk about the body attack of Andy Ruiz at one point and say that that could be crucial. It was a factor in the first fight, could be crucial in the rematch. And again, for me, the only real body shot that Andy Ruiz can land against AJ if AJ decides to box the way I think he should, which is literally to move around the ring. Don't worry about keeping center ring, just move around the ring. Obviously, you don't want to get backed up to the ropes. Make sure you're spinning off to the side and, you know, away. But use the whole of the ring. Don't just worry about standing in the middle of the ring. No, 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 no. That's a big mistake. Big mistake if he just tries to hold the center of the ring. Use the whole ring. Yeah? Make Andy Ruiz have to chase after you all the time. If you're doing that, I don't see Ruiz landing that many body shots, to be honest with you. He's got a much shorter reach. And if he does manage to land any shots when they're moving around the ring, they're not going to have that much power on him. Andy Ruiz doesn't have great power at long range, even in his jabs, if he has to punch at a moving target. If you're stationary and Ruiz comes in and hits you with a jab to the body, it's going to be a hard shot, all right? After Anthony Joshua got hurt, he was more stationary, which allowed Ruiz to get more shots off against him and harder shots off against him. Again, that's one of AJ's weaknesses. He doesn't recover well from a shot. But in general, obviously you want to minimize the amount that anybody's hitting you in the body but with Andy Ruiz I think the key is just movement move 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 and even if he does touch you to the body with a jab here and there as long as you're on the move and you know moving in the right direction he's probably not gonna be able to hurt you much with it obviously any kind of punch to the body and we've seen AJ look vulnerable to the body in several fights any kind of punch to the body is not gonna help you <laughs> but I think he can minimize the impact those body shots have just by moving around at one point, they start talking about how they recovered from losses and the psychological impact the losses had on them. Paulie Malin unsurprisingly, Paulie Malinaji and Tony Bellew, who we all know to be 
very emotional characters, they reacted the most emotionally after their losses. This is what they reveal in this roundtable discussion. Whereas the more clinical, less emotional characters like David Hay and uh, Carl Froch, they never talked to... Because like Paul Imanenaji and Tony Bellew talk about crying after losses in a dressing room. Tony Bellew said he cried himself to sleep after the Adonis Stevenson loss. But with David Hay and Froch, there's no talk of any crying. <laughs> Again, it's just different characters. You know, some people are emotional like that. Other people are not really that emotional. You know, they can go through something traumatic and there's no tears. There might be anger. You know, people express themselves in different ways and people are affected in, in, in you know, different ways. But it was interesting hearing Paulie Malinaji talk about the psychological impact that, you know, losses had on him and Tony Bellew and how these things can make or break you. David Hay said that his loss to Carl Thompson was the making of him. Because prior to the Carl Thompson defeat, he wasn't training at the level that he realized he needed to train to succeed at the top in boxing. And so the Carl Thompson defeat made him know, I've got to train a hell of a lot harder. I've got to stop going out to all these clubs. Because you have to understand, on the way up, David Hay was like a boxing playboy. In fact, he'd fought in the Playboy Mansion in America. That, I think, was the only time David Hay fought as a professional in the United States was early on in his career when he went to America and fought in the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the way that David Hay came up in the game, he was like this Playboy. He was modeling for certain uh, luxury clothing brands. And he was going out about the town and seeing lots of girls, going to strip clubs and all this kind of stuff. After the Cole Thompson defeat, it stopped. He realized, no, I've got to be spitting sawdust and very, very serious about this game. My natural talent is not going to get me to where I want to go. I'm going to have to train like an absolute beast to get to that level. So that was the making of David Hay. You know, um, Tony Bellew, a similar thing. Carl Froch, when he lost to Mikhail Kessler, that was his first loss. He said he didn't really feel as though it was a loss. You know, Carl Froch, perhaps, well, let me not say he's the most naturally confident of them because they're all naturally confident characters, uh, but an extreme level of natural confidence to the point where Carl Froch often didn't feel like his losses were actually losses. <laughs> and when you don't feel like your loss was really a loss, it's easier to take psychologically. In fact, Tony Bellew said the same thing about the Nathan Cleverly fight. He lost to Cleverly, but he said, I, I wasn't really that devastated because I didn't really feel like I lost. You know? But when he lost to Adonis Stevenson, he was, he was devastated. So at this point in the discussion, Johnny Nelson asks the panel, if you had to pick, you know, a winner, or will, in fact, I think the question he asks is, will Anthony Joshua win the rematch? Yes or no? He puts them all on the spot and says, you know, will he do it? David Hay, <laughs> being the natural politician that he is, refuses to give a straight answer. Now, of course, David Hay understands that Sky would like a soundbite. Sky would like to be able to edit it. So when they're putting highlights of this roundtable discussion, it's got Johnny Nelson saying, will Anthony Joshua win, yes or no? Then they can cut to a shot of David Hay saying, no. <laughs> and that will go viral and it will probably get to AJ and AJ will think oh, okay David Hayes doubting me and he's picking again do you know what I mean so David Hay didn't want his no or whatever answer he was going to be given to be taken out of context so he was dancing around and he wasn't given a straight answer in terms of yes or no does he think Anthony Joshua can, is going to win the rematch uh, so it's pretty humorous the way that Johnny Nelson is constantly pressuring David Hay for a straight answer and a lot of the others don't really give a straight answer either, but ultimately, I think Paulie Malinaji says yes. He thinks Anthony Joshua will win the rematch, and I think one or two of the others also say yes. But David Hay will not say yes or no. <laughs> now, for me, both guys have the ability to win the fight. One of the things I agree with, I think David Hay said this, is that Anthony Joshua 
his best chance to beat Ruiz was first time around. That was his best chance to beat him. Second time around, it's going to be a lot harder because Ruiz is more confident now. And AJ is battling demons. You see? Ruiz didn't know whether he could hurt AJ first time around. Ruiz didn't know exactly how hard Anthony Joshua could hit, what he was like to be in the ring with. So there was a, a certain level of cautiousness and trepidation in Andy Ruiz. But after what he did to AJ first time around, it is going to take his confidence through the roof. So in the rematch, you've got a more confident fighter and that's going to be difficult for Anthony Joshua to deal with. Potentially more difficult than the first time around in terms of what he has to be careful of. Okay? Now, if I had to bet my last dollar, my last pound, my last yen, my last euro, my last dinar, my last rupee <laughs> on who's going to win the rematch, Anthony Joshua or Andy Ruiz, if I was put on the spot, because I think either man potentially could win. But I would go with Andy Ruiz. If I had a gun to my, I would say Ruiz. And the reason I say it is because although I think Anthony Joshua has got the physical attributes necessary to beat Ruiz, I don't know whether he can recover psychologically from that defeat and the fallout of the defeat in this particular time period. Yeah, it's been several months, but you might need several years to get over something like this. It, it all comes down to the individual, which is why I have always said that if I was part of Team AJ, I would advise him not to take the rematch. You don't need to take the rematch. You're already rich. People are worried about him getting frozen out and all this kind of stuff. Well, he's got made enough money that getting frozen out is not really going to hurt him. <laughs> and I don't think he can get frozen out anyway because PBC don't recognize the WBO. So for one, there's a WBO belt in play. And for two, they've said that well, they haven't said, but, you know, others have said that the PBC plan on making their own belt and therefore trying to have the uh, other sanctioned body belts become ob obsolete. So they're not even planning to keep hold of all the belts if they do manage to get them. They're planning to let them go and then replace them with this PBC belt. But you see, yeah, you can have a PBC belt and have it represent the undisputed, but unless that undisputed champion, that PBC champion, is willing to fight all the top contenders out there who are not with PBC, then how credible can his claim to being the best in the division be in the long run? If all he's going to do is fight in-house fights, then I don't care what he did several years ago when he became undisputed for a brief period. He's not defending that status. He's only doing these in-house fights. It's no good. And I think a lot of the boxing public will see through that. And maybe some of the fanboys and idiots, but the hardcores who have any kind of objectivity, they're going to see through all that nonsense. Okay, so for me, I think Anthony Joshua should not have taken the rematch to, to allow him not only to improve technically, but also to recover psychologically. So I'm not in favor of him decided to take this rematch. But now that he's taken it, hey, you know, he's going to have to do what he has to do to try and win. But yeah, that would be my answer. I would say if I've gone to my head, if I had to pick, uh, do I think AJ's going to win the rematch? I would say no. Yeah, I would say no. So if he does, he's just ticked a box as far as I'm concerned, proving his psychological strength, you know? And that's something that we have to take into account with Anthony Joshua moving forward. If he manages to get past Ruiz, especially if he wins in impressive fashion, that's a, a very, very significant box ticked from a mental point of view. You know, that he can recover psychologically when he's so inexperienced that quickly and come back and get revenge on the same guy who beat him in humiliating fashion. You know, so it's a big uh, plus point for him if he can do that. But if he can't do that, it's potentially going to compound the demons that must already exist in Anthony Joshua's mind following that loss. At one point, they're talking about whether Anthony Joshua was just taking his rematch for the money. And most of them seem to agree that he can't be taking it for the money because he's already very rich. So it must be more about pride. It must be more about getting revenge. 
And certainly if we look at Anthony Joshua's uh, past history, when he had the rematch with Dylan White, of course, they fought once in the amateurs and he had a rematch in the pros. Anthony Joshua fought Dylan White with more spite than he has fought many other opponents. He wanted really to hurt Dylan White in that rematch. He wanted to prove a point, not to the people, not to the crowd, but to Dylan himself. It was personal between the two. And if you go back and look at that uh, AJ Dylan White fight, in fact, I think I've got it here. That's the, this was AJ in the first round, taunting Dylan White as he was hitting him and hurting him with shots, sticking his tongue out, sneering at him. That nasty, mean streak that AJ had against Dylan White was because of the fact that it was personal because of the fact that he wanted revenge on this man very badly. And I think that's the Anthony Joshua we need to see. We don't need to see him being reckless like he was against Dylan White, but we need to see the nastiness, the meanness, and perhaps we will see it. But as far as whether he's taking the fight for money, well, I don't think AJ's taking the fight for money, but is there a possibility that he's been pressured by Eddie Hearn, DeZone, Sky, has he been pressured by them? Now, can they literally force him into the ring? Is there something in the contract with any of those entities where they can threaten Anthony Joshua with legal implications if he doesn't take this rematch? I don't know. I'd be surprised if there is because AJ's made so much money, he can afford to pay for the best lawyers and make sure that He's in a contract which is beneficial to him and not, you know, more beneficial to uh, Eddie Hearn or DeZone or Sky in terms of control over what he's doing. But who knows? None of us are insiders on the situation. But, uh, as far as why AJ's taking it, I don't think he's taking it for the money himself. I don't think that's his motivation. I agree with the panel on that. But perhaps, you know, we have to leave the... the uh, the door open to the possibility that it's pressure from elsewhere, not from AJ himself wanted to do it, but from elsewhere. And they might not be able to fr literally throw him into the ring and make him fight, but it could be a situation where they're like, look, if you decide not to take this rematch, we don't know whether, you know, how long it's going to take us to maneuver you back into a position to fight for a world title again. It might be years. We don't know whether we're going to be able to back you the same way we were backing you before during your phase of rehabilitation. Are you sure you can even get to the top again? Because there's a lot of young, hungry fighters out there. There's Daniel Dubois, there's Hergovic, you know, so many contenders coming up. Usek's now in the mix. Are you sure you can make it to the top again? You want to go through that process? Or the quickest way is just to take the Andy Ruiz arena. So maybe he was, look, I'm sure Sky, the zone, Eddie Hearn, they all desperately wanted Anthony Joshua to take the rematch. That's that's one thing I can think we can all agree on. <laughs> there were none of them who were saying, Oh, we don't care what you do next, AJ. You know, if you want to uh, take the rematch, take it. If you don't, oh well, that's fine. No, they would have been desperate for him to take the rematch. But how much that influenced his decision, we can only speculate on and guess. David Hay says that. Anthony Joshua doesn't spar hard in training camp. That's what he's heard. He said that he spoke to Carlos Takam, who was one of Anthony Joshua's sparring partners. And he said that he wanted to spar hard, but AJ's trainer, his team will say, no, 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 no. We're just doing technical sparring. We're not sparring hard. Now, I know that AJ wanted to bring Takam in to training camp for the first Ruiz fight. So I don't know whether David Hayes talking about uh, Takam being in training camp for the first fight, or whether he's talking about Takam being in training camp for this fight. Yeah, in terms of not sparring hard. Because if Takam has been in training camp with AJ for this fight, and it's in the middle of camp and AJ is not sparring hard, that to me suggests that there may well have been some truth to those rumors that AJ got knocked out or hurt badly in sparring uh, for camp in the first fight. Because if they're not trying to spar hard for the rematch, then perhaps they don't want a repeat of what happened in the last camp of him getting dropped and hurt. 
You know? Now, again, I'm not saying he did get dropped and hurt, but I'm saying if Takam is in this particular camp and says they're not sparring hard, it could be indicative of that. You know? They don't want to repeat AJ getting hurt, can cost maybe going into the rematch. No. They want to make sure that he's nice and fresh and doesn't take a lot of punishment. Now, there's different philosophies when it comes to how you should spar for a fight. David Hay believes in extremely tough sparring. That's what he believes in. Uh, he many, many times has talked about the benefit of hard sparring. It, it, you, you become battle-hardened. You become ring-hardened when you spar hard in the gym and you go through these basically gym wars. It toughens you up. And you need that in order to not only develop the physical toughness, but the psychological toughness. So, you know, he always talks about when he fought Derek Chisora, he had Carlos Takam in for sparring. And he said the sparring was hell against Takam, especially in the first few weeks. Absolute hell. And he was thinking, how the hell am I going to get through this training camp? Never mind the Chisora fight, because this sparring against Takam is just hell on earth. I absolutely hate having this huge extremely physically strong guy, he's very fit, throwing loads of punches at me, I, I can't keep him off, he hated it, but as the training camp progressed, he said he started getting used to Takam's pressure and having somebody on top of him all the time throwing shots, and started having more success, he says that was perfect preparation for Derek Chisora, but there are other philosophies out there, some trainers don't believe in sparring hard, it all depends on the fighter, it all depends on their attributes, their mental makeup, their punch resistance, you know? Sparring hard, of course, is going to put miles on the clock. If you're somebody who doesn't like to spar hard, you might have more longevity in boxing. You know, it, it, it all depends on the fight, it all depends on the situation. I mean, Joe Calzaghe, for example, was notorious for doing very little sparring ahead of many of his fights. Now, with Calzaghe, a lot of the time it was to do with his hand, with his hand trouble, because Calzaghe had notoriously brittle hands. So for many of his fights, and I'm talking about for his big fights, he didn't do much sparring, but yet he still had tremendous success. I think even before the Jeff Lacey fight, he hardly did any sparring at all. Some people say he did no sparring, but yet he still went in there and put on a fantastic display and ended the career effectively of Jeff Lacey as a top level fighter. Yeah, Lacey went on after that, but he was never the same. So, and, and of course we've, we've had uh, people like Tunde Ajay saying he doesn't believe in sparring wars and all this kind of stuff because it actually damages the fighter going into a fight and it takes their longevity away long-term. And if we look at Anthony Yard against Sergey Kovalev, was it sparring which led to Anthony Yard losing that fight or, or a lack of hard sparring? I would say no. I mean, I'm not saying the hard sparring necessarily would have, would have hurt him, but Anthony Yard was able to take Kovalev's power for most of the fight. Um, he was, he, he never looked out of his depth to me. You know, he didn't look like it was too tough. It, it was at the very end when he basically emptied the tank as his trainer told him to. Uh, in round eight, at the very end in the, when was it, 11th, 10th, 11th round when he got stopped, that's when he was so tired that even a jab managed to put him over, okay? Would hard sparring have helped him get through that fight? Some people will probably say yes, who knows, but the point I'm making is Anthony Yard didn't go in there and get blasted out by Kovalev, yeah? He wasn't a guy who looked like he'd never tasted a, a, a heavy punch before, he got hit by Kovalev in that fight in the early rounds and the mid rounds and he seemed okay. He didn't seem worried about being hit. He was walking Kovalev down. You understand? Um, I think that experience, in the ring experience in you know, professional fights is what cost Anthony Yard. Not wh whether he's doing real tough sparring and having sparring wars. I don't think that would have benefited him as much as in the ring experience. You know? And again, remember, you are sparring a hell of a lot more rounds than you're actually going to fight. It does put miles on the clock. And they asked David Hay, well, they asked all the panelists, again, right at the end of the, uh, the show, yes or no, will Anthony Joshua win the rematch 
Tony Bellew says yes. David Hay refuses to give a straight answer. <laughs> it's hilarious seeing Johnny Nelson press David Hay uh, for a yes or no and David Hay just doing his whole politician routine. Hilarious. Malanaji also, like uh, Tony Bellew, says yes, AJ will win the rematch. And Carl Frutch as well, says AJ will win the rematch. Johnny Nelson is pressing everybody for answers, but he himself doesn't give an answer. <laughs> Maybe he has an out by saying, well, it's, uh, you know, journalistic impartiality. I, I can't be seen to be favoring one or the other. But come on, Johnny, if you're going to press everybody for a yes or no, at least let us know your view, who you think is going to win the fight. Anyway, highly recommended. Go watch it. Excellent analysis from all the guys. Excellent insight from the minds, the careers, and the knowledge banks of some former top-level professional fighters with vast experience in terms of what Ruiz and AJ are going to be going through, the mistakes made in the first fight, the mistakes potentially in the rematch, and the improvements that both can make in the rematch. So yeah, definitely catch it. It's on the uh, Sky Sports Boxing YouTube channel. Let me know what you guys think. It's Hatman, I'm out. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week, covering a wide variety of controversial topics, as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.